So again, my wife, she had the, the absolutely correct answer, in my opinion, you know, in hindsight, that the only thing that really matters is the sign, the support itself. She like, you know, she often tells me, you know, that's for you nerds to argue about. So, um, and, and also in a way, these overhead sign structures, I kind of, I kind of feel like they're the Rodney Dangerfield of transportation structures and they get no respect. You know, I'm, and I'm just as guilty as a structural engineer. I would much rather be designing a fancy bridge in the background or these bridges here, you know, at the interchange. But the overhead signs are, you know, that's what helps people to keep from getting lost. So, so um, you know, I haven't been super active, even though I've been a long time resident of Dallas and working in the area. Um, I haven't been that active here, so a lot of you guys might not know me. Uh, I've worked on various transport or you know various uh, traffic signal structures and sign structures and, and things over the years. But the two big projects that I was involved in were uh, uh, I was the sign support task lead for the DFW connector design build, as well as the uh, and there were a whole host of structures on that. Uh, you know whether it was textile standards or project specifics. Uh, you know the International Parkway has a unique overhead sign structure. And then after that project was wrapping up, we immediately rolled into replacing all of the overhead signs around Intercontinental Airport in Houston. And for those of you that have flown in and out of Houston, those signs were terrible. Uh, they're much better now. Um, and as I was trying to prepare for this, it's like, who am I, who am I targeting here? So I guess, you know, my, the intended audience would be, you know, people that are fairly familiar with structural engineering. Um, you may not be as familiar with the AASHTO specifications, you know, but on the left, we have, you know, the bridge specifications, whether it's the standard specs or LRFD. And even if you don't know those, you know, maybe you know ASC 7 or AISC or ACI, which are fairly similar, right? But a lot of you guys might not be familiar with the sign supports uh, on, the, on the right. And it's, it's its own standalone code. Um, and it is tailored for these particular structures. Um, so I'm assuming that, you know, you might not have designed a sign or specified a standard sign or something like that. So that's, that's kind of who I'm targeting here. And of course, I've got a few acknowledgements. Uh, you know, I'm pulling from the AASHTO standard specifications for structural supports for highway signs, luminaries, and traffic signals. A lot of times it's abbreviated LTS. And again, highway signs with variety of age, no respect. So even when you abbreviate it, you don't put in the HS for highway signs. You just go straight to luminaries, traffic signals. And so <laughs> the, um, uh, there's a fair amount of uh, text dot standards and I, you know, I showed the F dot standard initially and then uh, I've got a few photo credits. I don't have a library of these photos. So I, I really use a lot of Google Street View. If you don't see a credit, you know, it's just assume it's Google Street View with a few exceptions. Uh, uh, so my company, WSP, provided a few pictures for uh, DFW Connector and Horseshoe. And then, uh, and then as we worked on these projects, uh, you know, my colleague, Car uh, Karthik Ramanathan, was, you know, my, my number two. He, he uh, you know, he, he provided a lot of support. Matt Sneed is our, my traffic engineer, uh, who's now with TxDOT. Uh, when you're getting into a big program like this, you're going to get to know your traffic engineer very well. Uh, there's a lot of back and forth collaboration. Uh, a lot of this stuff was reviewed by Tim Bradbury down in the bridge division. And then uh, Elaine Jin and Bob Brown are current colleagues and they helped with this presentation as well. So why, why learn, you know, the, the science support code and, you know, various textile policies that are in place. Uh, and there's, it, it's a little difficult to really understand the state policies, a lot of times you have to kind of reverse engineer it out of the standards. Uh, there's not like a nice formal document that says, you know, this is the way TxDOT wants you to design a sign. But if you, you know, follow the examples given to you in the standards, you know, you can, uh, but, you know, of course our primary directive, our prime directive from the State Board of Engineers is public safety. And so that shows up in clearances and then you know, you don't want to undersize your sign. You, know, you want to size it correctly. Uh, you know, strength is essential, but it's otherwise unimportant. So uh, you're, you know, there are going to be opportunities to do project-specific designs. 
there's very few things that are off limits. Uh, you know, that if you and your traffic engineer can kind of dream it up, you can probably do it. Uh, and then if you're on a design build project, you know, the contractor is going to be pushing you to save materials and keep the cost down and things like that. And then, you know, some states uh, have a formal inspection program for these, but uh, I'm not aware of TxDOT having a formal uh, routine inspection program. But in case you ever do get involved in inspections, it's good to know the code that it was designed to. We can't prevent everything, of course, you know, so if the if the hydraulics fail on this truck while it's driving, and I, I struggle to understand like how the driver doesn't notice this, you know, how the driving doesn't just feel different, but nonetheless, um, you know, we need to set our signs with a certain amount of clearance. You know, it's, these sign structures are extremely vulnerable, you know, and when there is an impact, it's, you know, immediately affecting the travel lanes below. So the code's kind of set up in such a way to where, you know, you kind of rely on the fact that bridges, like the bridges in the background are a little bit more robust and can take the hit better. But unfortunately, a lot of times the signs are placed in front of the bridge, you know, for sight distances and things like that. So we can't prevent everything, but, you know, we can set things to where we get. I'll assume that sign is higher than the bridge. It is, and I'll be getting to that here in a second. Don't worry. This incident occurred just a few weeks ago, and much to my surprise, I like a colleague Karthik sent this to me, and he goes, you know, your presentation on overhead signs is quite timely because look at what just happened. And I was like, you know, I, I like I don't remember hearing about this. Well, it just so happened that I was traveling out of town that day and drove under that sign about an hour before it came down. So it's kind of sobering to realize that, um, but. You know, we've got some good pictures of this. Uh, you know, all the news stations sent their helicopters out there. And, um, you know, so you can take a look at the foundation here and I don't see any distress in the, in the soil. In fact, the, the, the bolt ring looks nice and intact. Um, so this came down, like it says, on February 18th at about 3.15 on a Friday afternoon. High traffic, very dangerous, thank God. Nobody was hurt there. You know, everybody was able to avoid it. There's some dash cam, pretty interesting dash cams that uh, if you, if you uh, go online, but I mean, this, this looks clean. I mean, it doesn't look like it's in the base metal at all. I mean, the, the ring for the, for the base plate is still there. So something happened with that connection. But of course, at this point, you know, it's still actively under investigation. You know, I'm not going to speculate what, might have caused this, but I guarantee you, TxDOT is uh, scrutinizing this. I mean, this particular structure, for those of you familiar with the area, is probably 11 to 12 years old. Um, you know, this, the Sam Raver Tollway Interchange at 75 was finished in early 2011, if I remember right. This shouldn't be happening on an 11, 12 year old structure. Uh, and, it, and thankfully, it doesn't very often, you know. So I'm not exactly sure what caused this, you know. They're, but I guarantee you, if, if you specify it incorrectly, TxDOT's going to come back to you later. Um, uh, you know, but there could have been a fabrication flaw. I mean, who knows? Um, so safety, of course, is our prime directive. You know, but you're also going to run into a lot of unique situations. And in, in urban areas, when the roadways are very congested, you're going to attach signs to just about everything you can. You know, you can attach them to the sides of bridges. You know, the, this is what we did at the Intercontinental Airport. Um, we had very little skew here, so that simplified details quite a bit. But when when you have a skew on your bridge, your details are going to get a little bit more complicated because the sign has to be visible to the roadway. It has to be perpendicular to the travel lane. So you got to, you know, you're going to have to push it forward a little bit and angle it. Uh, such that it's visible to the drivers because that's all that really matters, as my wife pointed out. Um, for aesthetics, sometimes you might choose some hollow steel shapes. You know, the International Parkway, uh, you're, you might be familiar with that. That was one that we designed as part of the, uh, the uh, DFW connector. Uh, also, there's the Margaret Hunt Hill Bridge, which this is a rather unique looking uh, overhead sign structure that's a uh, on either side of the bridge. Um, but yeah, so if you're going to design that, you kind of have to understand the code. Uh, 
And then also, a lot of times the gores occur on bridges, you know, and you, you've got your, your brakes to go to the various direct connectors. So these side structures are going to be attached to bridge. You know, on the DFW connector, they wouldn't let us do like what's shown here on the horseshoe. Like we actually had to carry it all the way down to the ground. So we had a sign structure over a direct connector that was almost 80 feet tall. But if you're going to load rate the bridge, the I-35, you know, the I-35 or 345 bridge in Dallas uh, has had fatigue issues over, you know, over time, you know, so that support bracket is mounted directly to the girders. You know, if you're doing a load rating on these, you're going to have to account for that. Um, you know, the, the more common detail nowadays is just to extend the bent cap out a little bit, it gives you a better support. Uh, and of course, the horseshoe had a lot of uh, aesthetics involved. You know, there was kind of the bull nose, uh, the full bull nose uh, finish on the ends of the uh, columns and, and everything. So um, I'm not going to get into DMS signs too much. It's, you know, just in the interest of time, uh, there's a lot of ground to cover and I don't have that much time to cover it. But uh, there are some standards available for DMS signs. And, you know, if you start getting into that, you'll need the code as well. Yeah, but also the, the panels, the, the DMS panels are improving. You know, this, the older ones tend to be much bigger and bulkier. You know, displays today are improving rapidly. And so, you know, the size of these signs can be reduced potentially. But we did design for a single line. DMS on DFW connector that was hung from the bottom of the trusses. I don't go through this area too often, but every time I have, I've never seen those things through now. So I, I wonder why we did it, but um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, it's if you're gonna if you you know we had to take into account the fact that there's additional exposed area for wind and also additional deadload. Uh, there. Yeah, that's the single line DMS. That's the, the, so that's supposed to be a dynamic message sign, but I've never seen them turned on. You know, the, the few times that I've driven through the area. So, so I guess with that, I'll start getting into the code a little bit. Um, uh, so this is kind of my transition slide for various sections, and this is the table of contents from the sixth edition of the Signs and Engineers Code. Uh, so, with regards to the geometry, that's all found in se uh, segment or section two. So, this is one of the graphics in Ashto. And horizontally, we have to stay outside of the clear zone or barrier protected because it's a fixed base, it's not a breakaway. Uh, and then for vertical clearances, because bridges are a lot more robust than the sign structures, you know, we set this about a foot higher than the nearest, or you know, than the controlling clearance for bridges on the corridor. So on DFW Connector, we actually set those quite a bit higher. I was kind of surprised. Um, you know, why are we setting these at 21 feet high? That's higher than what we're used to doing. And then in the years since then, TxDOT's announced their freight network, and that has higher vertical clearances, 18.6 instead of 16.6. So the fact that we set those at 21 feet, it's a little bit of conservativeness, but that allowed for, um, you know, the freight networks, you know, I think TxDOT specified that in the design criteria, thinking ahead about the freight network. So, um, and then with regards to how you set your sign panels, that's kind of what I'm trying to get at in this slide. So this is pulled from the TxDOT standards. And here, here's kind of the ratio as to how to set your sign panels. So you set it just ever so slightly pushed up on the truss, but you, you pick your controlling sign, the largest sign per that. And then if you have other smaller signs, you just line them all up. You know, so for those, you would set those down a little bit because you want the bottoms of those signs to line up. And if you look back at old standards, or if you go out and inspect old structure, you might notice that some of the signs have a five degree tilt, you know, to kind of tilt it back down at the driver. But that's not really done anymore. The panels, the you know, 3M has greatly improved, you know, what gets applied to the aluminum uh, sign. And so it's called the retro reflectivity. It's, it's uh, quite, quite good. And so it doesn't have to be angled down and you still get great visibility at night. So, uh, so it's much simpler to just mount it vertically. Um, again, no respect 
like I sealed these plans and they were still changing things. So you notice the revision triangles. Uh, if there is a conflict between a sign and anything, they move the sign quarter mile, half mile, doesn't matter. You know, it's easy for the traffic engineer to update his sign cap, but for the structural engineer, I have to start over. I got to find a new roadway cross section. I got to get all my new elevations. I, you know, I, I kind of, I was getting very frustrated from doing a lot of repeat work, you know, until finally I was just like, I can't keep doing this. I'm just going to wait until a little bit closer. I've got all my tools in place. I can just make one last sweep right before we see a plan and get everything updated. Um, and so the lesson learned in that is to, you know, use, I, I've, I like MathCAD, I'm a MathCAD fan, but, you know, you can also use Excel to set up, you know, basic parameters and, and you know, to help you automate a lot of your calculations because things are going to keep changing. But here's a cantilever, standard cantilever structure as part of the DFW connector. Um, you know, we gave the location just based off of northings and eastings because it was kind of off on its own. Um, you know, other times we'll specify it based on an alignment, a station, and an offset. You know, so here's an overhead signs bridge, OSB. Again, standard things keep changing all the time. You know, we change the sign, the roadway section changed. You know, that affects the the tower sections selected. Uh, so you just got to keep. You know, so even after you seal it, you may not be done because, you know, again, they'll, they'll just, they keep moving signs all the time. So I'm not going to spend too much because, again, my target audience is people that are familiar with structural engineering. So uh, I won't spend too much time on chapter four or section four. But uh, just to hit the highlights of it, it, you know, we use basic theory of elastic structural analysis. We include second order effects. I guess the a couple of things at the bottom are the main items I want to hit in that it is the standard specifications are an allowable stress design that, you know, over time codes have moved towards LRFD, but this is still allowable stress. And, uh, and then also because these structures are so light and so sensitive to aerodynamic effects, the combined stress ratio equations end up becoming really a lot more important than like say for bridge or the demo is just a much higher percentage. And so, um, you know, so, so uh, your combined stress equations, you're gonna have to really, uh, you know, those are important to check, you know, as you go through the various sections. Okay, so chapters three and appendix C start getting into loads. Uh, so this, you know, for the science supports, this is equivalent to ASCC 7 in building design. Uh, and we've been, we follow a lot of ASCE 7 uh, in these, especially with regards to wind provisions, and I'll get into that. But it's important that, you know, you know that Appendix C is here because there's a lot, it's the older method of calculating wind loads, but a lot of textile standards are kind of grandfathered in under that appendix. So starting off with your load combinations, focusing on the first three load groups, uh, you know, then there's the fatigue limit state group four. So I'll get to that later. But the first three, the, the three different loads that you got to consider, dead load by itself, dead load plus wind, uh, dead load ice plus half wind. So those are your three load groups. And again, you have your allowable stress reductions, which this is a little different because I'm used to not having much of a reduction when there's a single transient load, but here we do, we have a 1.33 reduction factor when we apply wind, but it's, it's there. So, so you can go ahead and use that. But so those are the three load effects that we gotta, we gotta worry about, dead load, wind, and ice. So for dead load, that's pretty straightforward. Um, so just to let you know, if you're looking at a truss structure, you know, the TxDOT standards give you a pounds per foot uh, on the standard that you can use for that. And then in addition to, you know, just the, the primary structure, you've got a lot of the attachments. So there's various standards available to help you get your demos for your attachments. You know, nowadays we don't use lighting and walkways as much. You know, you might find some old sign structures out there, or if you got a DMS structure, you know, you don't need a walkway for maintenance. You know, so um, but on typical overhead sign structure, which is what I'm focusing on, you know, you'll leave out the lighting and the, the walkways. 
and any associated liability that goes with that. And as I said, there's two different methods for calculating wind pressure, and they're both okay. The one on the left is the older style, the fastest model, and you got to make sure you're using the correct wind maps, wind speed maps. You know, the three second gust on the right, all of the wind speeds are nominally higher. But as you read in the commentary of the code, the code's been calibrated such that you get very similar results, no matter which, which method you use. So a couple of the key differences to point out is that um, on the left, you'll notice, I mean, there, you know, I'll focus on the uh, empirical dimensions, um, the equation at the bottom. So the, the differences are that the you see on the left, it's 1.3 times velocity squared. That 1.3 can be considered like a gust factor, but the fact that it's within the parentheses means that you have to square the gust factor, right? So when you look over here on the right side with the three second gust, you'll notice that velocity is still squared, but the gust factor is no longer in the parentheses. So it's just gust at a single, you know, with, with a power of one. So that, um, the CD is the drag coefficient. You know, you see CD show up on the right, you know, so drag coefficients are important. CH on the left is essentially equivalent to what you see on the right, the KZ. It's a height adjustment factor. So the higher the sign, the more exposed it is. And there's a, there's a multiplier to take that into account that, you know, as you go up, the wind velocities tend to go up with elevation. So CH and KZ, you know, do the same thing. And then there's a new factor I also, you know, mentioned it below that the gust factor for this one is 1.14. That's part of the calibration process. It's a little weird, but that's, that's just, uh, that's what they did. Um, and, but for most of these overhead sign structures, you're assuming a 50 year design life, service life. And so the, the uh, importance factor, the IR is, you know, just 1.0. That's kind of what the code is uh, calibrated on. And it's taken a long time to adopt these, you know, like there's a lot of textile standards that like you read in the notes, they'll say that, you know, this is designed in accordance with, you know, the ASTRO specifications from 1975. So that design is as old as me. But um, those were all done with the older fastest mile maps. But, you know, the wind codes have been improving quite a bit over the last 20, 25 years. Um, you know, with ASCE 7 taking the lead, um, you know, so in 1995 was when ASCE switched over to the three second gust. But the signs and movement air su support code, the LTS, didn't, didn't update that until 2001. And, and, and it was really important to do that for the instructions, again, because wind is so important. But all of the standards that were designed previously, you know, there is no program in place to kind of modernize those details or, you know, kind of, so they're grandfathered in, you know, they haven't changed the, those, they're still under the fastest mile. So when you're reading the, those particular standards, the OSB trusts and the Kenrever trusts, you know, you just got to understand you're looking at the fastest mile. And the width, again, the, the velocities for the three second gust are going to be higher, but keep in mind that the codes have been calibrated to give you a similar answer at the end. So, um, you know, so ASCE 7 has continued you know, improving. So they, they went, you know, uh, what I'm calling kind of the second generation where, you know, now they're starting to think about uh, mean reoccurrence intervals and uh, things like that, that, um, you know, that starts showing up in 2010 and then improved upon in 2016 already. The sign support code, Still, still is on the original three second gust, the first generation. So finally in 2017, just five years ago, LRFD bridge, that's the LRFD bridge, which used to be an extremely crude wind design code, finally updated to the three second gust uh, in kind of the, the second generation, like similar to the ASCE 710, which has the reoccurrence intervals that are 300 years, 700 years, 1700 years. You know, you're looking at some of these extreme winds. Um, and the LRFD size luminaires code is the laggard because it's out there. It finally got released, I think, for the first time in 2015, but very few people use it. Uh, 
And I'll talk more about that here later in the presentation. But so you, you kind of need to understand where you are on the adoption curve, you know, with textile standards so that you can you can interpret the standards correctly. So here's a, a map that's provided by Textiles. This is a standard sheet. You know, this is per the old fastest mile uh, provisions. You know, the, the state's divided up into various wind zones and design wind speeds. And it's a little hard to see in here, but there's a little line of circles that kind of follow these county lines. They call it the ice line. So if you're above the line, you're supposed to include ice in your design. If you're below the line, you can omit it. Um, and then, of course, over here on the right, these are all of the standards that this map is applicable to. So you can, you know, help that helps, you know, guide you um, as you read the standards. So if you're looking at the monotube standards, the monotube standards are newer and they use the three second guts. These, you know, these date to 2013. And so you can see how the wind speed has gone up, like the, the, here in North Texas, we're up to the 90 mile an hour, whereas previously we're at 70 miles an hour. Uh, again, same design, it's calibrated, but in order to use the newer wind provisions correctly, you have to use the higher wind speed. Um, and again, these are mainly for the monotubes. Uh, there's a couple of different uh, wind load applications that you got to think about. So this is, uh, so in addition to the different load combinations earlier, you now have a couple of load cases for the wind. And so normal is, you know, like if you're looking at the sign, that's the maximum exposed area that you can blow wind on. And so that's, you have to consider load case one at a 1.0 factor and then you figure out what the exposed area is transversely. And um, uh, pick up the pace. Um, so, uh, so typically low case one controls. Um, and then here's just a couple of free body diagrams um, with, uh, that this is also found in the code, you know, just a you know, plan view and elevation view and how you apply these as distributed loads. Ice load, pretty straightforward. It's a three PSF. Uh, if you have a sign panel, you just apply it to one side. For overhead sign structures, this rarely controls. You know, you, you know, the normal wind at at uh, you know not without the load one half load factor. Uh, group three rarely controls. So when it comes to specifying these, uh, starting with the cantilevers, these are all the cantilever standards that are available. The top one I'll highlight because it's the selection example. So that gives a lot of good commentary that you'll follow uh, as you work through your design. So the main thing is like, which, which uh, standard do I pick? And there's several different, uh, I'll have to take questions at the end. So, <laughs> um, you know, so for the various wind zones, there's designs for each zone. So you kind of start with your base wind zone, but there is a minimum sign area that textile designs for. So it's 10 foot tall uh, sign panel. And for cantilevers, it's times 100% of the span length of the cantilever. So in the event that your actual sign area exceeds that, you know, because you're worried about the product of the two, you're worried about the pressure times the area, you know, another way you can do that is to bump up your effective wind zone. So if, if I'm in a wind zone four in North Texas, you know, I can, but my sign exceeds that 10 by 100%, I can bump it to wind zone three, which gives me, you know, so now all of a sudden, just based on the square of the velocity, I can increase my effective or my allowable sign area by 30%. So, so that's, that's one of the tricks um, that you can still use the standards uh, even though you might exceed that design sign area. And then from there, um, you know, basically you're pulling data out of the standards. You know, the standards give you all of the structural uh, data for uh, member sizes. Uh, there's also, um, let's see, uh, there's serviceability requirements. So the standards include, you know, deflections and things like that. And then it also gives you foundation loads for you to start looking at, uh, you know, drill shaft embedments, things like that. And so the way it worked on DFW Connector was, you know, again, Roddy Dangerfield, no respect. 
we had no borings for sign structures, but there were a whole lot of project borings. So we would look at all of the borings around, see if there was one close enough that we could use. But if not, we would fall back on this uh, N equals 10, which is a conservative um, you know, soil parameter to assume. And so you need to fill out this table. This is also another standard sheet. And I, I boxed in the ones that come from your cross section. But all of the other ones that are not boxed, you know, you're pulling that data off of the standard. Um, okay, moving on to OSBs. They, they use a very similar approach for OSBs, except there's a lot more standards available. There's with ice, without ice, there's typical heights, there's high heights, uh, you know, so you, there's just a whole host and I know it's hard to see on this particular slide, but that was kind of the point. You know, the, the standards keep running off the page. So it's, uh, but again, the top one is the selection examples that gives you a good kind of worksheet of how to, uh, so here summarizing that, you know, again, like I stated, it's very similar to cantilevers, except um, you know, uh, there's just more standards available uh, for, with regards to, um, let's see, the sign area. So the effective sign area, that, or the minimum design sign area for a truss or for a span has actually been decreased a little bit. So for a cantilever is 100% of the length, but for a bridge, it's 75% of the length. Um, and then I also wanted to point out that, like, when you get down in Houston, you know, the Houston highways are extremely wide. And so the trust standards, the typical trust standards only go up to a span length of about 155 feet. Well, in Houston, you know, to span these roadways, you, know, you might have to go even longer than that. And so there is an additional standard that's included that takes your trust span lengths up to 200 feet. So you can get those... Um, um, again, without any sort of a custom design. Um, you know, once you figure out which standard you're going to pull your data from, you just start pulling data from it. Or you get all of your member sizes, bolt sizes, deflections, you know, foundation loads, um, you know, and, and otherwise, you know. You, now, one other thing about OSBs is that they typically tend to be a two column tower. And so when you think about overturning, you know, you're going to be controlled by the uplift capacity of the shaft on the back side. So it's more of an uplift uh, that you need to worry about in your foundations as opposed to just embedment and, uh, you know, like kind of direct bury of a, of a shaft. Similar, you know, you, you, on your cross sections, you got to, you know, you know the, the ones that are boxed or come from your cross section, but everything else is pulled from the standards or you calculate. So Texas is a little unique in the sense that we use a lot of concrete. We're a concrete state, and, and for aesthetics, a lot of times we've we've started you know putting concrete columns in. You know, this is one of the earlier examples that I'm aware of down on Ben White in Austin, where they have concrete columns, and in addition to that, there's a concrete beam. Uh, they use just use a box beam for mounting these uh, signs. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into these, but. Uh, you know, just be aware that these are out there. So a couple of districts, Houston and now San Antonio, have some district standards for concrete columns. Uh, you can see what I'm talking about from the incredibly long spans that Houston has sometimes, and you see that there on the left. They really, they really started it in the sense of developing some district standards. So the one, I kind of like this one on the right as well, because uh, I like how they've tapered the column down a little bit. You know, you, the top, the capital has to be big enough to support the truss, but you don't need quite as much for the column size. So it was, you know, they, they tapered it down and thinned it up. I, I thought that was kind of a nice effect that, you know, this was this, our, we were on a design build for DFW connector. And so the contractor really wasn't interested in a lot of embellishments, but he had to do a concrete column. So we kept it simple and just chamfered the corners. But again, we followed a lot of those, the Houston district standards uh, and the way they did it. Another alternative that you'll see around uh, that uh, WSP used for horseshoe is this through bolt connection that you see on the left. So there's four through bolts through the concrete and then uh, that, that attaches a couple of brackets, an upper and a lower bracket, and then the standard truss attaches to that. 
or sometimes in I, on I-30 in Dallas, I've only seen these as cantilevers, uh, but you'll have the bolts sticking out the side, you know, so, um, so those are a couple of variations. Uh, a few pros and cons, you know, to use the bearing supports, you know, that's the, Houston and San Antonio have standards for that. And I think that also it, it handles construction tolerances a little bit better. You get a little bit, of, it's easier to order your truss early and, and it fits. If you're doing the bolted connection with a sign bridge, you know, construction tolerances and column location become really important. So a lot of, I, I know on, uh, on a few other projects that the contractor ran into issues where the truss didn't quite fit. And it's like, you really got to survey it after you build the columns to make sure that you get the location right. But, um, you know, when I've talked to the contractor on a couple of occasions and their preference is the easier through bolt type uh, connection. You know, so even though me personally, I kind of like the bearing design, you know, the contractor thinks that it's easier to build, uh, you know, because the form works easier. Um, now there is one other big difference that I'll get to here is that the OS, when you have a through bolt, uh, like the horseshoe, that opens up a couple of opportunities because it's very similar to the cantilever design. Because we're all used to, in these construction work zones, we're used to how we can only build segments of bridges. And, um, and so we might not be able to, you know, just based on how the work zone is, we might, you know, we can only build a section of the bridge like we see in the bottom. Well, the same is true for overhead sign bridges. So I'm kind of picking on that one right there. So if, if in the ultimate condition, that's supposed to be a sign bridge, but he can only build the, the one. And, and what if you need to put in a temporary sign for that exit or something like that? So with having the through bolt configuration, if you keep consistency, you can, during construction, put on a cantilever truss. It, we've, had, we've actually been asked to do this a few times on Southern Gateway. So you can temporarily attach a cantilever truss, you know, with a temporary sign for, and then once you can finally build the column on the inside, well, then they take that truss off and put up the permanent OSB uh, sign bridge. And because it's an allowable stress design, my personal recommendation, it doesn't say this anywhere in the code, but when it comes to concrete columns, I would recommend that you go back to the standard specs for bridge because there is no reinforced concrete section in the signs of the Luminaire's code. Uh, if you look at that table of contents, you won't find a reinforced concrete section. So what else? So what else do you do? Well, I would go back to standard specs, which uses a consistent allowable stress philosophy. Moving on to monotubes. Uh, sorry, I'm picking up the pace quickly, but uh, so here's a standard text dot monotube south of San Antonio on 37 going to the coast. The standards for these are bundled a little bit different. And so you get a package for the cantilevers, you get a package for the spans or the, the sign bridge. And then they also have a, a dynamic message sign standard at the bottom. So, so when you pull down that PDF, you know, you basically get the entire package of standards that you need for all of the connections and things like that. So, so to kind of hit the highlights of what's available, there's two different designs. There's a 90 mile an hour for most of the state and then 130 for close to the coast. And uh, again, these were designed for the newer code, make sure you're using the three second gust wind speed maps. Uh, the, the, the way that these standards are organized is that um, the spans are kind of, the, the span lengths are, are you know, vary a little bit. And the other thing that really varies is the column height. So at, for the longer spans, your column height is really reduced, like sometimes down to like say 15 feet. So in that case, you know, in order to get the right clearances, you might have to run the drill shafts up a little bit higher to compensate. And for the cantilever, you can see that like for the truss, it was 100% of the span. This is only 80% of the span. Because as you get further down that radius, it's just harder and harder to attach signs out there. So, uh, but for the, for the span part, the bridge, it's still 75%. I'm not gonna get into section five very much, but section five is steel design, you know? So for these monotubes, and it's kind of its own little standalone steel section. Like you, there's really no need to go back to the standard specs. You know, everything that you need is there. I will get into fatigue briefly. I'll hit the highlights of them. Uh, so fatigue has been an evolution 
uh, just like our wind speed provisions. Um, so pre-2001, it was not even a consideration of the code. I, you, when you study the TxDOT standards, I, I think there were ways that TxDOT kind of compensated for that by designing the panhandle for a little bit higher wind speed, but nothing explicit in the code with regards to fatigue. So, but that changed with NCHRP 412, uh, that report issued in 98, which made it into the fourth edition in 2001. And of course, the most critical structures were the cantilevers and the high mass lights. You know, by the fifth edition, 2009, they added um, not the cantilevers, but the sign bridges. So, you know, these are supported on two sides. Same with the traffic signals. And then, of course, you know, now that that foundation is in place with each subsequent edition, you know, they just kind of keep adding, uh, on, you know, improvements to the to the different fatigue details available, the allowable stress thresholds and things like that. So this is the, uh, you know, these are the fatigue loads that you have to consider. You consider them one at a time, like not concurrent. Um, the cantilevers are, you know, you gotta consider three different uh, load, fatigue loads. And for the non-cantilever, they'll nick out. But because all these signs tend to be very vulnerable and over traffic, you know, I, I typically just, for those, go to category one because uh, it's a high hazard. Uh, the most critical one is galloping, which is applicable to, like, say, monotune cantilevers. Uh, it's a 21 PSF load on the face of the signs, which is comparable to some, like, live loads, like, like say, roof live loads, things like that. So it's a pretty big load. Uh, I could talk a really long time about this because it's, you know, <laughs> it is kind of a, a, a weird phenomenon. It's very rare, um, but nonetheless, it will control for your monotube cantilevers in non-hurricane zones. Now, going back a little bit to the cantilever trusses, if you have a four-cord truss like the TxDOT cantilever truss, you can omit this load. So uh, those, are, those have enough internal damping and things like that to where... It's, uh, it's not as big of a deal. Uh, all right, so natural wind gust, this is just a day-to-day -day wind gust that you, you know, it's a much less, it's, it's a much reduced load compared to, you know, like say galloping. And then there's a truck induced gust. So as the, if you have your science structure set low to the traffic and a truck drives under it at 65 miles an hour, it creates an upward pressure. Rarely does that a control because it's, you know, you only apply it over a 12 foot width, like the lane width. And, and usually there's just not enough exposed area for this to really be significant. You know, it might be more significant if you have a thick DMS cabinet or something like that. But, you know, for, for what we're talking about today, it's, it usually doesn't control. And of course, after you get your fatigue loads and you have to get into the fatigue details and here's a sample, you know, so there's a lot of additional details in here compared to like, say, the standard spec bridge code or the RFD bridge code. So was that value for all? Okay, uh, again, I hate to speculate because it's so early in the investigation. It, I mean, is that a possibility? Absolutely. I mean, I'd be sending that down to Austin, you know, the materials division, inspect the truck and you know, inspect that pole and that base plate and check the metallurgy and everything. So, um, but as of right now, it's, it's hard to say. Um, well, I'm just have some contracts. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, I can see that from the news photos that were there. And so, you know, that, that's an obvious, obvious failure point that, uh, you know, absolutely. You know, but was it a fatigue issue? Was there some sort of fabrication flaw? Because this doesn't normally happen. You know, even though this, even though those standards weren't designed explicitly for fatigue, you know, there's lots of those structures in service and they haven't been doing that as much. So, you know, again, to, to really know what the root cause is, you know, is, is going to require a good investigation. And with regards to Intercontinental Airport, um, you know, that, that was a design build project and the contractor initially was thinking about using the standards, but then we convinced him to um, that we could optimize the design. And, um, and so in order to optimize the design, we had some different span lengths and column heights that we needed to 
you know, that weren't quite covered by the standards. Um, and then, uh, and also there's a few constructability issues with the, the standard monotubes. So, so we eventually got the contractor on board to, to pay us to, to optimize those. And so the design optimizations, you know, I mentioned earlier that the standards are for the 90 mile an hour wind zone and 130 on the coast. But the Houston airport is kind of in the middle. It's in this 110 zone, it's in North Harris County. So by counting on the actual wind speed, you know, we're able to reduce our design forces by over 28%. You know, we're below the ice line, so no ice. And also the standards do not have stiffening connections. And so, especially with regards to fatigue, it's the fatigue at those connections. And so if you put stiffeners at that connection to get the section modulus that you need, then you don't need quite as much of a tube thickness. You know, if, you're, if you don't have any stiffeners, well then that thickness of the tube and the welds and everything have to work at the base. And then any additional that you need for that connection, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna use that same tube thickness for the entire height. So by using stiffeners, you can kind of balance it better. You can pick a column thickness independent of kind of what the base connection needs are. And so that was, and if you look at the NTTA standards, they have their own standards. Uh, they use a stiffen design. And comparing our final design results was that, you know, we needed to go, our, you know, for, for our site, we needed a cantilever that went out to 40 feet, whereas for the 130 mile an hour standards, it could only go 35. And also we were able to stretch the column height from 20 up to 30. And similarly for the OSB or for the, for the span, you know, with the two supports, you know, we had to push it a little bit and raise the column. But because fatigue is important, like, you know, we did increase the yield strength of the, you know, we picked, we worked with the fabricator to pick a slightly different steel, uh, but there's kind of limiting returns on that because, you know, strength is important, but fatigue doesn't care what the grade is. You know, it's the fatigue is all about the everyday stress cycles. And so yield strength really doesn't play uh, when it comes to fatigue. But based on, you know, those couple of things, we're able to reduce from maximum thickness, plate thicknesses of close to one inch, you know, down to, you know, like say close to five eighths and three quarters three, and three eighths of an inch. On, on, and so even though there's extra fabrication costs for adding the stiffeners, the material savings for the rest of the pole are more than made up for it. And for constructability, um, we, made the, we made the cantilevers and the span shapes all identical, you know, we used the same sizes, you know, so it's extremely easy for him to set up his, uh, you know, his process at the shop. Another important one was increasing the bend radius. So he was having a really hard time doing that bend radius without crushing the inside of the curve. Like he tried everything. He filled the tube with sand and, you know, all these things that kind of help keep that from crumpling. But, um, uh, but you know, so by going to the thinner section and bumping that to 12, it was much easier for him to fabricate it. Also, that pushes your support, you know, that pushes your connection for that mast arm to pole connection out another foot. So, it, you know, kind of indirectly reduces your loads too. And the contractor had a preference for two inch anchor bolts, whereas, you know, the textile standards are two and a quarter. So he wanted us, you know, my, I initially wanted to go up to two and a half and he asked me to go down to two. Um, so we're kind of getting close to the end, thankfully, because I'm running out of time. So just, and a good New Orleans word that I grew up with is lanyap, so here's a little something extra. Uh, in the code in Appendix B, there are some very helpful design aids. So as you go through and do a lot of your own calculations, you know, when it comes to like the area of a, of a hollow tube, you know, you could do pi r of the outside squared, you know, minus r of the inside squared, or you can just kind of go to the middle times the thing, you know, so there's, there's a lot of simplifications that, you know, that be aware that Appendix B is there and there's, you know, how do you calculate deflections of a hollow taper two? Well, some of those equations are in here. So, so just, uh, you know, depending on your situation, there's a lot of good uh, information in Appendix B to help simplify, you know, because I do recommend automating your calculations. You're going to have to redo them quite a bit. And then looking forward to the future, you know, I kind of hinted at it earlier, but there's the LRFD, LTS. Finally, 
We have synergy between the bridge code and the support code. So if you have a signed support sitting on a structure, you can calculate your loads once, you know, bring them right into your bridge design. The downside to this is that TxDOT just isn't very familiar with it. So they're still familiar with the old standard specs and, you know, they're gonna kind of push you that way. You know, the, the wind load applications ever so slightly different, but in reality, it's, you know, the 1.0 for the normals usually gonna control. Uh, and also ice loads are no longer considered like almost anywhere in the code, uh, you know, unless kind of there's a few select locations, like if you're near the Great Lakes or if you're in Alaska, but they found that ice really doesn't matter really anywhere in the country, you know, unless there is a real heavy demand. And also, so TxDOT, just to, we caught wind of this, uh, that TxDOT is revamping their pre-certifications. So for those of you that do TxDOT work, it's important to get your pre-certifications uh, so that you can be task leads for these pursuits and things like that. And so they're, they're going to be revamping this again. So this is like the second time they revamped it. You, you, know, you kind of see the evolution. I pulled this from a PEP slide. Uh, you know, the program was created in 97, you know, big update in 2018, and then now there's already another big update. They're adding a lot of categories. One of the categories to be added is overhead science supports, 5.6.1. So, so if you have a minimum of three years uh, designing these, you can apply for this uh, pre-cert category. Uh, it's no longer like a special, special, uh, uh, you know, so this is kind of what I hope to get out of this uh, for you guys uh, that, you know, kind of give you a quick overview of the uh, current state of the practice, you know, where appropriate trace the historical developments of wind speeds and fatigue and things like that. Get a little bit of familiarity with the textile policies and standards. Um, there's a lot of information on the traffic and these standards are found on the traffic division webpage, not on the, not on the bridge or, or the roadway, it's on the traffic. So the, the three available are signed bridges, cantilevers, and monotubes. And then, you know, just a quick little introduction to overhead sign structures or non-standard overhead sign structures. And then a uh, little bit of a look to the future, uh, kind of where we see it going. So that's all I've got. You know, just... Thank you, John, for presenting to us today. I, mean, are there any, I, I don't know if I got time for questions or not. It's like five minutes. Yeah, we have five minutes for the main meeting. So do you guys have last questions? Yeah, um, I have one. Uh, when the snowstorm happened uh, last year, were, were ice loads, I guess, a factor on the side? Like, did, did signs ever come down with the new loads? I mean, we've been designing for ice, and, and it's uh, only, only based on road that we get to choose that to color up and see how we get the way. So, if you're, if you're designing for the old code, the old code has ice like that. So, it's all about the machine. I don't need to design for the old code. You don't want to make a you're the of the same technical sides of the propagation design. I'm just thinking here, and I see that from the school of practice, there's a little bit of variation. How much soil do you want to be from the level of soil? What's your common practice?